very warm welcome to you all from everyone here at London South East. For those of you who don't know me, I am Donald Leggett. I'm Head of Investor Relations at London South East. I'm your host for this evening. Once again, we're delighted to welcome Primary Bid, who are sponsoring our autumn webinars. Primary Bid's focus is to give retail investors, just like yourselves, access to one-off public company fundraisings and IPOs on the same terms as institutional investors. The best way to keep up to date with their fundraisings is to register for their website, primarybid.com. The four companies speaking tonight are Great and Gold, Poolbeg Pharma, Helium One Global, and Rainbow Rare Earths. Over to Greatland Gold. We start the evening with AIM listed Greatland Gold, the mining explorer and developer at the development stage of a world class gold copper discovery in Western Australia. Averian is a world class asset, and Greatland chose the JV with Newcrest, Australia's largest gold miner. Newcrest are experts at low risk development, and our nearby mill at Telfer makes Averian a low capex project. As you might expect, Greatland is already exploring for a further Tier 1 mineral deposit in Paterson using advanced exploration techniques. It's working hard to become a multi-commodity mining company of significant scale. It's not doing too badly as today the market cap is around £700 million. We're delighted to have the CEO, Sean Day, live with us from Australia. Welcome, Sean. Thanks, Donald, and thanks for having me this evening. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic to have, have you this evening. Thank you very much for staying up so late to, to be with us. It is a little bit late here um, in Australia, but um, yeah, ha happy to do so. Good to connect with you and, and the audience. Okay, swell. Look, we've got 30 minutes. So why don't I spend 15 minutes going through the presentation? An important event uh, last week for Greatland with the release of our pre-feasibility study on the Havron development. And that will leave us uh, a solid 15 minutes for, for questions, which I think people will enjoy. So with that, look, let me just start by orientating people around the strategy of Greatland. It's, there's three key pillars to our strategy. Firstly, look, expansion of Havron. We want to deliver Havron, uh, a world-class asset, on time and on budget for the benefit of Greatland shareholders. In addition, we want to accelerate uh, our commitment to exploration. We want to continue to expand that program. And of course, you know, we want to invest in that drill bit and try to create value for shareholders th through discovery. And then finally, um, the third pillar is that opportunistic growth. How do we augment uh, what we have already in the portfolio by continuing to um, look to, to improve that portfolio? perhaps by acquisitions and, and other opportunities to, you know, add financially disciplined um, opportunities into the portfolio. The, the feasibility study itself or the pre-feasibility study, you know, is, is an important step for us, but it really is a first step on the journey. You know, we commenced the decline um, earlier this year this study is really designed to support that initial infrastructure going into the ground. Uh, as, as people would be aware, this, this first step is just on the southeast crescent of Havron. That's this high grade backbone that, across, um, that sits across this southeast. It's really just a fraction of the um, Havron ore body. And indeed, this study just covers a fraction of that um, southeast crescent even, really making it a, a fraction of, or of a fraction of our ore body. And such is the quality of Havron, that notwithstanding, you know, there's only a small part of Havron included in this study, it, it still delivers significant returns for shareholders, notwithstanding it's carrying all the capex to get Havron into development. And this slide really just shows that pathway to first production towards the end of calendar 23 and then full size production into calendar 24. I talked earlier about this study is really just the tip of the iceberg. Even within that growing resource base, this only constitutes 28% of that initial resource. And I talked before about the return that this 
study still delivers of a 27% IRR and a three-year payback. That's notwithstanding to develop the southeast crescent, this small part of the ore body needs to pay all the capex for the whole road back to Telfer, the power coming back, development of that Havron permanent camp, and the decline all the way down to the body, um, ore body and around 550 metres of development. So it's a substantial amount of capex. And the fact that it still generates this return, this payback, unlocks all that free cash flow for us. Again, just speaks to the quality of, of the um, project. And again, we've done all of this with our partner, Newcrest, which has 35 years experience operating in, in the Patterson, which gives them a lot of insights on cost structures. They're already operating in the Patterson, 45 kilometres down the road in Telfer. That's a big part of the centre of gravity for the development of Havron, and all those costs are very understood. So it also makes the reliability of this study, I think, very high. This slide is, is worth pausing on. We've also released our, our maiden reserve. And I like this, um, this diagram of, of Havron in the, in the centre there because this helps hopefully portray what I mean by a fraction of the ore body. Yeah, the broader zonation is, is this grey brescia. And then we can see this kind of looks at into that ore body and cross section from the southeast highlighting the southeast crescent on this side, which remains open at depth. But just those, those red areas is what's being stoked, what's being mined out. So you can really see this is just a fraction of that southeast crescent and gives you some flavour as to the upside, the growth that is ahead of us. The best of Havron is yet to come. The capex is exceptionally low. And I think that's really positive for us. The way this is being developed by driving into this high-grade southeast crescent is just tailor-made for Greatland as a mid-cap. For us and our balance sheet, we want a low capex hurdle, a low funding requirement to, to jump over and then get this high-grade ore through the mill, create free cash flow, and then we can generate that to deliver further growth. That's continuing to grow Havron and continuing to um, fund our exploration activity. So effectively, by getting Havron into production with this Southeast Crescent, Greatland becomes fully um, self-funded. With this initial $73 million um, that we need to fund, uh, I think there's a great opportunity for us to engage with banks uh, to bring this in. From a banking perspective, they also see this as low risk. It's Brownfield's development for, um, for Newcrest, leveraging that existing um, Telfair infrastructure. And that's an exceptionally you know, modest um, value for a development to get into production. And what, again, talking, I think, to the quality of Havron, the discovery of Havron and, and the announcement of that um, have five kind of first uh, discovery drill hole as we think about it was in 2019. So it's been an extraordinarily short period of time to be here with the development already underway, the study complete. And again, I think talks to the confidence that we have at Greatland of putting in this into production. And perhaps it also gives you a feel as to the approach Newcrest is taking in, into this and their desire to get have run ounces through the mill. And again, this slide really just captures the fact that we are leveraging this existing infrastructure and that's what um, makes this, this low risk threshold uh, to get into production and, and makes that profile um, of CapEx relatively low. That unlocks um, this us into production and the takeaway on this slide is really just that grade. Uh, 4.58 grams is an exceptional grade. And that really tells you why we're targeting this Southeast Crescent. It's, it's a high grade ore, so it's going to generate really strong returns. And we'll talk about cost shortly, but that allows us to create a margin of over US $1,000 per ounce, uh, which is exceptional. 
So turning to that low cost um, nature of Havron, this is a, a cross section profile of the um, cost of Australian gold mines. And you can see Havron to the left of screen as, as we look at it. It's, it's very much in that lowest quartile. And when you, when you look at those um, Cadia, Fosterville and Tanami, those assets are all in you know, significant portfolios, are really bellwethers of the Australian gold sector. And that's the company that Havron keeps. Uh, it's an exceptional place to be in. And it tells you that Havron operates through the cycle, which I think, again, is really important. And perhaps this is my favourite slide in, in the whole presentation, uh, which again centres on the cost. And it presents that Greatland as a, as a company would have the second low, lowest all-in sustaining cost on the planet. That's, that's kind of worth pausing on for a moment, that we would be the second lowest cost um, miner on the planet. Yeah, it's yeah. Again, it talks to the quality of of Havron, and yeah, you know, with that, we there's also some potential to walk down these costs from the study. This study does, um, you know, we are going to continue to look at the study in in more detail, and we've already announced that although this is a two million ton per annum study we're actually going to be taking a 3 million tonne study um, through to the next stage of feasibility study. Uh, and again, there's opportunities to walk down the cost with approved efficiency from that um, larger scale um, operation. And the study assumes that this is the only ore going through that Telfer mill. So presently just 2 million tonnes per annum going through a 20 million tonne per annum mill. If we can increase the volume of material out of Havron, both from that Southeast Crescent and from the bulk opportunities across the rest of Havron, we have a great opportunity of amortising those fixed costs and that general administration cost across more ounces, reducing cost. And similarly, uh, Telfa owns the, that Telfa ore body. They, for those following Telfa um, or following Newcrest, they certainly are promoting the opportunity that they'll be able to continue the life of Telfa. And again, that will be more ounces, will reduce the cost for um, Havron, which is beneficial for us. And again, hopefully brings more material into our economics. And similarly for Telfa, lower costs, you know, provide that virtuous feedback loop that more Telfa or will also be economic to bring through that mill. So good for both companies, good for both mines. Yeah, this, this slide just really tries to talk about that expansion opportunity I've, I've just touched on, that this study is just looking at that Southeast Crescent. The great expanse of that ore body is sitting inside that Brescia. And as we continue to drill that, as we continue to um, understand that part of the ore body strong, better, we get closer to understanding the opportunity to apply a bulk mining methodology across there and absolutely change gears to a much larger Havron development. This is an important slide, this one. It, it, again, it just talks to that infrastructure that's being put in place with this initial um, Havron development. You can see that decline down um, the left-hand side of that ore body. Uh, all of this capex of that initial 400 metre through the Permian layer and then down that 550, 600 metres across the ore body is all being carried by this existing um, 14 million tonne um, study. The potential to bring more ounces on these existing levels for extremely low capex and then expand it down a little further to bring in the rest of that southeast present is still only a fraction of the capex that had to be spent on this initial development. There doesn't need to be a second hall road. There doesn't need to be another camp built. It's really just an extension of the existing infrastructure. And that tells you that the capital efficiency of that larger study is going to improve. And again, we're taking that 3 million tonne study um, through, to, uh, through to the feasibility study. And then of course, there's the opportunity to augment all of this 
with that further bulk mining study across the whole, the whole size of Havron. I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll skip across this slide, but I think let's pause for a moment on, on this Havron slide, because this is about that broader zonation. That red area there, that Southeast Crescent, is effectively that part of the ore body that is captured by this study. But that broader gray outline and, um, and indeed the extensions with the blue is that broader zonation. And as we continue to drill, what we're seeing is that Northwest Crescent, um, described as that Northwest pod target, is starting to join up into that Northern Brescia to create this corridor of higher grade through the center of the ore body. So together with good intercepts sitting outside of that area, but we're definitely seeing this Northwest trend, which is a little bit of a, a, a feature of the entire um, Patterson district. Then what's exceptionally exciting and something that we're spending a lot of time on is that Eastern breast share target. This is sitting outside of the original Havron area. It's, it's a really um, interesting, it's a new intrusive, slightly different geochemical signature. Havron doesn't need to get bigger to be world-class, but sitting there in the Eastern shadow of um, Havron, we're seeing another really meaningful feature. When you get 200 metre width um, intercepts, that's something that really captures our attention. And the overexpansion of that is some 600, 750 metres. So uh, exceptional to have that growth for, um, opportunity already um, within Havron. Sustainability, look, I'd love to spend more time on this, but again, in the conscious of time, conscious, conscious of time but again, I, I think we should have a lot of confidence in Newcrest as our joint venture partner to focus on this area. And they're certainly, um, from our perspective, it's something we really want to see a lot of focus on as well. It's, I do want to pause on the exploration opportunity. We've talked about Havron. There's also proximal targets. We've recently significantly expanded our footprint across the Patterson. Uh, we want to continue to, to have drill rigs spinning um, across our Patterson holdings. And we really like the option value that creates within our portfolio. Uh, for us, finding the next Havron and applying our competitive advantages in looking undercover in using that expertise is really important to us. And indeed, there was an announcement today with Jury, which is the other joint venture here on the map um, marked with the Black Hills deposit um, with Newcrest that we're moving to stage two, which means uh, Newcrest is, is seeking to put another $17 million into that project uh, to continue exploration, which I think is good news for Greatland shareholders. The broader portfolio, uh, again, we enjoy, particularly Ernst Giles, I've spoken about a few times, is our Archean Greenstone, where a lot of Australian discoveries, um, gold discoveries sit. I think it's great to have that in the portfolio. For those following us, the team, we've spent a lot of time investing in the team. We've built that up. And again, it's all part of us having the ability to understand, to contribute to with peer review Newcrest and scrutinise the development to make sure it's um, in the interest of Greatland shareholders. And with that, we've also added to the board, I think Paul Hallam's been an um, exceptional um, addition to the board, very well known in the Australian environment. So with that, why don't we try to jump across to some questions, uh, but hopefully that gives you a really good overview of the company presently, and particularly this recent um, pre-feasibility study outcome. Great, thank you very much indeed for that, Sean. Um, so the pre-feasibility study, all good. Uh, why did you particularly plan to go down the early starter mine route? What was the thinking behind that? And did it come from Newmont or did it come from you guys or was it uh, a classic JV? Look, the, the, the joint venture is, you know, has a, you know, tries to create cooperation um, be between Newcrest and, and Greatland and we have a very good relationship with them. But I think the, the real driver here is that Telfer was coming to the end of its mine life. In, in 2024 is, is meant to be the last ore as Telfer is presently um, contemplated. Of course, I think there's a great opportunity for them to add to that life. 
But Newcrest doesn't want a gap here. They don't want to demobilise Telfer and then recycle it up as, as Havron comes online. So there's been this big driver to get Havron or into um, Telfer by 2023. Part of the great benefit to us is not just the physical infrastructure there at Telfer, but the 1,200 people in situ with that 35 years collective experience up there in, in the Patterson district. So I think it's in both companies an advantage if we don't have a gap year at, at um, Telfer and we we get we plough into Avron quick snap and that's what this study helps supports. Yes. Does that get, add weight to the three million tonnes study being being a possibility then that you were mentioning? Yeah, look, the, this study was in, is is based, that's been released, is on a two million tonne study. <laughs> to some extent, it's already out of date as it's been released because we're flagging, we're taking something 50% bigger, being a three million tonne study into the next round, the feasibility study, which is due out around this time next year. And then, of course, augmenting that, we're looking at a much broader um, mining program with the bulk mine. So... Really, this is the best of Havron is ahead of it. And I, I did hear Sandeep from Newcrest describe the, the other day in the Newcrest call, the economics only get better from here. It, you know, it, that's exceptional to have you know, a study that's so strong already and really just see upside ahead of it. Perhaps we, we ought to uh, uh, talk jury stage two the, you know, the, and 17 million or more of new money going there. The, the, if you guys are... are, are Serious about this, aren't you? You're really, really going going fast and hard. Yeah, look, ab absolutely. Look, uh, I think it's, you know, we, we see our presence in the Patterson as multi-layered. Um, multi you know, we've got the, the Havron, obviously, the, the jewel in the crown and, and the flagship asset, and, and that takes a lot of the focus. Then, then we have further exploration with Newcrest, and we like working with that team They've got a lot of experience and we learn from each other through that and, and we've got a huge amount of respect for them and we're delighted that they're taking jury through to the next round. And again, it reflects some confidence that we have in the ground there. We hit some first mineralisation there recently. It's always nice to know that the rocks there are, are, are carrying some level of mineralisation. And then thirdly, we have 100% owned ground. I'm particularly fond with that and as um, some shareholders would appreciate, we currently have the rig spinning uh, at Scallywag, 100% owned tenement as we speak. So, uh, you know, we're excited about that program um, in, into, you know, which is going to move forward to the end of this calendar year. Okay. Um, uh, Jonathan Dixon uh, asks, I think he asks several questions, but one of them is about your, your uh, funding options for the $73 million, uh, million dollars that you mentioned. That's, that's your share of the, of the joint venture due. How will you, how will you, how do you propose to, to uh, raise that? Bank or, you know, is it debt or equity, essentially? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a great question, I think, by, by Jonathan. The, look, the overall funding, if I, if I take a bit more of a moment to explain it, is about $123 million US. Now, 50 of that is being provided by the existing debt facility, which is drawn for about 20 million, and we have 30 million remaining. The, that gives us a lot of runway. That's, that's meant to take us to around this time next year, to about September, October 2022. So there's no particular urgency in, in, in further funding. Um, so time is always valuable in these, in these circumstances. But what we'd, what we'd like to do is engage with the banks. We've already had two or a couple of term sheets um, given through to us by, by major banks. Uh, we want to continue to engage them. Really, the banks are lined up around the block to, to fund something like this. Brownfield, Newcrest quality, tier one asset in Australia, which is a tier one jurisdiction. It's right down the fairway for the banks. So what we'd really like to do is bring them in complete a, a full funding package, and that perhaps covers that entire 73 million. Um, and again, we've got the time frame to do it. And such is the quality of this pre-feasibility study, not just the outcome, but the amount of work that's gone into it and the ability to leverage the existing infrastructure and the existing known cost structure gives the banks a lot of confidence around the quality of this um, study. 
which gives us every opportunity to actually bank a pre-feasibility study, whilst normally you'd have to wait for the, the final feasibility study. I think we have every opportunity to bank that ahead of schedule. So something to look forward to in, in the next, say, six months. So uh, listen, folks, that's, what you've just said is very significant, isn't it? Yeah, look, I, I, again, I think it's exceptional to have a discovery in 2019 and in 2021, you know, having already started the, the decline down and then having such a low threshold of capex that is into production and then we're generating that free cash flow that we can reinvest into have from. Again, tailor-made for the balance sheet of a junior and or a global mid-cap and we should really be popping champagne corks that, you know, great, that, that with our partner, we are charging into this development, you know, rather than sitting back and maybe unlocking the whole Havron, which we're all terribly interested in seeing. But of course, that would, if we sat back and studied this to death and drilled it out like a pin cushion, it would add time and cost before we got to that free cash flow um, uh, event. So I think for us, it's, it's perfect. So before, we, before you go, before we lose you, uh, uh, Newcrest Mining can apply to buy a further 5% of the project in December. This is another one from Jonathan Dixon, mentioned by a few others. How on earth can you get an accurate fair market value uh, worked out when there's still so much infill drilling and developing of the asset remaining? Yeah, another good question. Look, we, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I've come in kind of post that original deal being done with Newcrest. And, and naturally, you see the strengths and the weaknesses of, of transactions when you come in. You know, it's, it's interesting looking at the option being exercisable in the current period because Havron's still in this growth um, phase. The good, the good news is, I think, in this is, you know, it's something that's got to be um, worked together between the two parties. The, the pre-feasibility study, as we've said, only covers really a fraction, well, indeed a fraction of a fraction of this ore body. So when you're trying to understand the market value of the asset today, look, you have a, a great sighter there with the um, pre-feasibility study in terms of low capex and low cost. But what do we really want to add to that study? We want to add a lot more tons, a lot more ounces. And that exploration program does show you that, look, there's a lot of opportunity there on the Southeast Crescent and then the broader, um, you know, bulk mining opportunity. So the opportunity is to try to add value across those areas as well when thinking about what is the full value of Havron and, and as such what's 5% worth. But there's no doubt over time that becomes more and more apparent and lower and lower risk to achieve. So um, with ongoing drilling success. So... It, you know, I think the, the more drilling that gets done, the, the better positioned we are in, in respect of that option. Okay, a very brief, very brief last answer. I, uh, sorry to rush you. This is absolutely fascinating. Um, what do you expect to see in the next six to eight months? What, have, what can we look forward to? Yeah, look, I, I think it's a really busy period. You know, some 50,000 metres of drilling have been completed since the cutoff of this pre-feasibility study that we already have a lot a lot of that's been announced. We have a, um, in the next couple of weeks, we have an updated exploration announcement. We're looking to update our Jork resource and reserve statement uh, in the coming months. That's really significant. We talked about the funding program going on. Uh, and then that all leads into the, the updated feasibility study. So yeah, there's a there's a huge number of catalysts and, and a lot of work happening over the next kind of six to 12 months. And, and I think that creates a great opportunity for um, Greatland and its shareholders. Sean Day, see you at Greatland Gold. Thank you very much indeed for joining us live from Australia uh, this evening. Thank you. You're such a star. Hey, Donald, really enjoy the, um, the time and the discussion. So thanks again. And our next company up is Poolbeg Pharma who, as you probably know, are the AIM-listed pharma business, which was spun out from its famous parents, Open Orphan. They spun out in July and they raised £25 million. Uh, Poolbeg is targeting the, uh, the infectious diseases market, which is expected to exceed $250 billion by 2025. PULB's initial assets come from Open Orphan, the infectious disease and human challenge trials business. That's the one that you know all about. 
which means Poolbeg has access to knowledge, experience, and clinical data from 20 years of clinical challenge trials. The company has already inherited a phase two ready influenza immune modulator and says it hopes to acquire new assets. Here with us tonight to shed more light on the business are Jeremy Skillington, CEO, and Cal Friel, Chairman. Good evening, Donald. And uh, I'll let Cahill give a little bit of background to where we came from, and I'll talk at length about where we're going. Yeah. So, look, uh, folks, uh, delighted to be speaking here from Whitechapel in East London. It's dark outside in the offices. This is the open or from pool bag office. So, look, the background. Look, I'm very excited. We've had a good run with Open Orphan. We've a lot more running to do there. Say, oh, say, what's that space between now and Christmas? We won't disappoint you, you the long suffering shareholders. But tonight's about pool bag. Where did it come from? What we're trying to do, we're trying to build a leading infectious disease company. Poolbag Pharma successfully spun out of Open Orphan in July 21, raising 25 million, a heavily oversubscribed fundraise. And basically, look, the background is HVO is a clinical trials company. Clinical trials company should not be competing with our customers. Pfizer, uh, the CEO of Pfizer announced earlier this summer that we did a cracking phase two uh, RSV study for them. Uh, that was in Open Orphan HVO. And actually, the CEO of Pfizer uh, doesn't mention many small companies like us. I'm sure he'd be quite pissed off if we turned around and said, by the way, Mr. Pfizer, we have a better product than yours. But we might have. And that's where Poolbag comes in. So the assets are in Poolbag. And Jeremy's job is really to drive Poolbag. But I think, look, there's probably a bit of confusion. And the reason I'm so excited, it's always great to have something unique. Poolbag is absolutely unique. Bear in mind, my first pharma company now, uh, Ambert Pharma, Donald used to present maybe eight years ago, was, was formerly known as Facet Oil and Gas, a little 20 million struggling company. Amrit now is a billion dollars enterprise value, did 200 million last year, 300 million this year. So look, we have big plans and Poolbag, I think will go up many, many multiples in the months, not years ahead. But why is it unique? It's unique in that we're not falling in love. There's gonna be a host of assets. Jeremy's under pressure and he will get them in. Over the next couple of months, we'll be between six and eight additional assets at PO about 001. We're not gonna pay very much for them. We're gonna get them cheap up front. Uh, and Jeremy will tell you how we're gonna do that. We're not gonna uh, spend too much, but critically important, we're fully funded. This is not a little pharma company that's gonna be raising money and raising money. We're fully funded. And uh, we're going to spend two, three million per asset. And then Jeremy's got a huge knowledge and background on um, the business development side. So every week, every month, we'll be talking to big pharma. So if any one of these assets work, it's many hundreds of millions. And just look why says unique. Jeremy's last company, Inflamazone, was half a billion up front and potentially a billion. That's almost 60x return on shareholders value. The only other company in the whole of Europe is doing something like we're doing is Evotech in Germany. It changed focus. It was a CRO four or five years ago, three or 400 million market cap, share price three or four P. Just look at Ergomed today. Uh, not Ergomed, Evotech today. Share price is 43, 44, 10x uplift, seven and a half billion. So that's no pressure to Jeremy. I will be hanging around more often, but that's the kind of uplift, 10x. So before we do, Jeremy can tell us how we're going to do that 10x. But I'm actually thinking this is probably one of the most exciting opportunities outside of Open Orphan. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, appreciate the uh, uh, the colorful introduction. Yes, I'm very excited to be on board, and I appreciate the, the audience here tonight for, for joining us, uh, which uh, for a presentation is quite different to the last one, but uh, congratulations to them. So as Carl said, we we inherited assets uh, from Open Orphan uh, when we spun out. We're... we're as I say, relatively new. We're just uh, three months out, and uh, we've uh, we've started going with the what we've inherited is down here on the bottom. Pob zero zero one. This is an immunomodulator for severe influenza, and we've got plans in place to move this uh, rapidly into the clinic. There'll be a recurring theme through this presentation about speed and uh, being cost effective, and I'll speak about those. So I'll, I'll talk about that later on. Uh, on the left hand side, what I'm very excited about is uh, as Carl said, we've got a very unique data set where uh, we're going to interrogate all of this by artificial intelligence. And that uh, technology is, uh, as you know, relatively new as computer power has increased. We're now in a position to be able to mine this challenge data, this infectious challenge data to see how the immune system is responding to an infection and then coming up with new targets and new drugs to, uh, to, to target those. So we'll be very unique in this. This is something that pharma isn't even doing because our data set is so unique. And I'll speak a bit about that. And uh, from uh, the other things we inherited, predict viral. I have one slide on that. This is uh, we've uh, we filed new IP on this last week around uh, diagnosing pre-symptoms 
who's going to get a severe infection, who isn't. And again, a fascinating, the biology of this is just absolutely fascinating. You could do a full presentation on this alone, but obviously uh, not, not tonight. Uh, and then uh, I won't touch upon our vaccine discovery platform, but from an infectious disease standpoint, there's, uh, there's three legs to the stool. There's therapeutics, there's vaccines and diagnostics, and we're playing in all three of those. But as Carl said, we're very interested in bringing in other complementary programs as well to run them through uh, our very efficient uh, programs and uh, get key clinical data, which is what pharma wants. And I, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. I won't dwell on this. The team is absolutely outstanding. We've, uh, we've built a team with great experience, great knowledge, great success. And I think, uh, you know, I won't dwell on this too much. We, we've complemented with, with, again, a terrific board across a business experience uh, across the industry, you know, many, uh, many decades, and uh, including uh, Luke O'Neill, who's uh, a thought leader in immunology. And Luke has been a fantastic uh, you know, asset has, since he joined the company back as when we were founding uh, back in the early summer. And he brings a lot of wealth of knowledge and experience. Me in particular, I will spend a minute, I'm a, I'm a PhD scientist by training. I'm almost uh, 19 years now in the industry, starting off in the, UK, in the US, in California, working for a company called Genentech, and then uh, moving back to Europe, uh, 2009, working for companies in the UK, Germany, and Ireland. So great experience. I've got the Rolodex, let's use the old terminology, of all the pharma contacts, all the pharma BD. And we know that pharma are always looking for products. If you look at their pipeline, roughly half of their pipeline is in, in license, brought in from other companies. So we will leverage that knowledge, leverage that uh, connections, and uh, be the, the deal maker of choice of pharma who want to do deals in the infectious disease space. And given what's gone on in the last uh, 20 months, there'll be a lot of activity. And this is summarized here. I think 2015, there were warning signs that we should be aware of a global pandemic and people ignored it. Uh, we know now, 20 months later, what the impact on human health and the uh, global economy has been. And there's a demand on pharma and a demand on the, the industry and governments that, not, that this will not happen again. So everybody's gearing up to the, the next uh, preparedness for the next pandemic. And that's where pool bag will be. The market is expected to be 250 billion by 2025. Again, as I say, that's across therapeutics, vaccines and diagnostics where we're playing. And uh, we plan to be the partner of choice for pharma to give them the assets that they're looking for to fill their pipelines. And I said, we'll do the early de-risking at a very low cost. And then pharma will take that on board and bring it forward into a more a robust phase two, phase three clinical trials to get the data they need for approval and marketing. That we leave that to pharma, that's their expertise. And this is a slide about how we are different. You know, there's many biotechs out there who you know, bring in money, they, they spend it all on one program. And if it works, uh, great. If it doesn't, that's it, they're done. And a lot of time you get gray, gray area, ambiguous data. So we don't plan to take that at all. We won't be spending on full phase two clinical trials and spending our, our hard earned investments. So what we plan to do is take this multiple shots on goal approach and we'll be capital light. So it's a case about bringing in uh, clinical or near clinical uh, programs uh, spending two to three million each program and using these human viral challenge studies that HVivo have, have, have brought on board and are experts in. And uh, we'll get results in 12 to 18 months. This is human data. And this is what pharma seek, what they crave, what they're passionate about. They can make big decisions without human data. You can have all the preclinical data you want, but once you have human data, that's what gets pharma excited. So we'll be there ready to have discussions uh, as, we're, as we're going through the development path and uh, having multiple discussions with pharma and creating a bit of a bidding war. And uh, as Cahill said, you do one deal and it's for eye-watering amounts. And I'll talk about that later on. So the plan is to bring in multiple programs as well as pushing on our internal programs as well as uh, you know sourcing our finding from our internal programs new targets new drugs and then develop them rapidly so we've got a clear growth and partnering strategy as i say we won't plan to bring this forward ourselves we're not going to be a fully integrated biotech company we'll do the early de-risking and uh, be very clever with the spend as i say monetize five or six assets uh, frequent partnering as we know, any one of, one of these deals could bring in 700 millions and we'll be cash generating from this income from these deal terms. And I just have a few examples over the last few years. And I think it's worth pointing out that infectious disease deals were relatively few and far between before the pandemic hit. And now that's accelerating because pharma, they, they turn on a sixpence and they realize that there's, there, there actually is money in infectious diseases, given the, uh, the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna experiences in the, the COVID vaccines. So now they're looking at the other viruses, other infectious diseases, where they should uh, put their money, where they put, put their bets. So a couple of examples here. Uh, this is a territorial deal, Revar licensed Liam by 120 million upfront for RSV, a space that we work in. Uh, Merck acquired Oncommune, who had a COVID program, 425 million upfront. 
to take the company out. And then Pfizer at a, at a relatively niche uh, infectious disease area, Lyme disease, 130 million up front. So if you get that human proof of concept, human data, this is where Pfizer gets very interested and we plan to play in that space. Cahal mentioned Infosome, the last company I worked with, founded in 2016. We raised 55 million from venture capital financing, so private equity, and we exited last year, acquired by Roche with 380 million euros up front and significant downstream milestones. And I think what's key, what's, what's worth pointing out is that we had phase one safety data, that's where you put it in healthy volunteers, and we had our molecules in one patient. And it showed uh, if effic you know, efficacy in one patient, and that was enough to rush to, to come on board and, and swoop us and take us out. And they're moving that forward now themselves in multiple disease areas. And uh, they say it's a good exit for, uh, for our investors. And of course, from a financing standpoint, uh, this was just announced last month, where the White House has been very proactive to, uh, to invest up to $65 billion in, in preparing for future pandemics. And we've already been in touch with, uh, with, with the folks at DARPA about uh, looking at our lead program and potentially funding that. So there's a lot of, uh, as I say, a lot of uh, appetite for funding these programs, particularly from governments and uh, for reasons I gave earlier about not having a next pandemic to deal with. What's interesting right now is we're starting our lead program in an influenza. And as I say, we're, we're all sick and tired of viruses I can only imagine. And a new word I heard last month was this twindemic, which uh, had me rolling my eyes. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's valid concerns that we're still in the presence of COVID. As you know, there's, the numbers are still quite high, particularly in the UK and elsewhere. But what people are afraid of is what's coming from an influenza standpoint. I mean, influenza has been quiet for the last uh, 20 months because people have been socially distancing. They've been mask wearing and washing their hands. But the concern is now is as the world returns to relative normality, that influenza will come roaring back. And that's a, that's a grave concern. And this is a slide uh, that we pulled out last month pre pre presented by the, the World Health Organization. And uh, you can see down on the bottom right here, this is the instance of influenza in India. So you can see it's been very flat over the last number of years. And now influenza virus is coming back. I actually just got my, my own flu vaccine today, just in, in preparation. But there's the concern of, uh, you know, to the healthcare system, that influenza, influenza comes roaring back and uh, the COVID pandemic is still here, they're going to be overwhelmed. So grave concerns about, uh, about viruses and their potential to, uh, again, cause even more havoc than what they've been doing. So a little, uh, a couple of slides on our lead program. It's for severe influenza. And uh, it's a program that, uh, that targets a, a protein called MAP kinase. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, P38 MAP kinase. But in an average year, influenza affects one in eight people. Five to 10 million of these are hospitalized. 12% of these are life-threatening. And there's a half a million deaths. And I think in years gone by, that was people relatively accepted that these things happen. But I think post-pandemic, post-COVID, there'll be demands to get this number down. And uh, Poolbeck can certainly help in that space. I said there are vaccines out there, I mentioned, but there's a scramble every year to identify the strain of influenza that's emerging and rapidly generating these vaccines in eggs. And it's a, it's a long time, it's a bit of guesswork, and the efficacy isn't that great where we're used to better. And I think from a flu standpoint, there's a narrow window for therapeutics. Tamiflu is one example where on its label, you can only give this drug within 48 hours of symptoms, and after that, it's useless. It's a viral uh, replication inhibitor. So basically, if it's after, if you already have symptoms, 48 hours after symptoms, there's too much virus on board for this uh, antiviral to have an effect. And this uh, market was once over a billion. And uh, as I say, hospitalization that follows on that, there's nothing there for you. And that's where POD001 comes in. Because what drives the severe flu is a cytokine storm. And what triggers the cytokine storm is the activation of P38. And we've got a small molecule inhibitor of P38 that blocks that progression. So we block that progression of severe flu and uh, reduce the death rate accordingly. So we've got plans coming uh, next year to get this into the clinic. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about these plans later on, but potential to be a potential a blockbuster for a severe influenza. But of course, in other diseases. I mean, it's well known that these cytokine storms occur in other diseases, other viral diseases, so there's a potential to go broader, so this market could expand for us. And this is our program, POV001. It's, uh, you know, the market now is expected to be 800 million, if, if not greater. Peak sales from the analysts are 275 million for our product alone, but again, label expansions to other diseases. It's a phase two ready small molecule, P38 inhibitor. It's already been in the clinic for rheumatoid arthritis. It didn't work. So now we're repositioning this based on data that the team at HVIVA have generated. The P38 has a significant role to play in severe influenza. 
the molecule is ours. We've got worldwide rights and we're moving that forward. It's safe and well tolerated. As I say, it's already been in the clinic. We've uh, we've got ex vivo outside of the, you know, the body uh, efficacy for influenza. And we filed lots of intellectual property. We're protected out to 2038. Uh, it was granted in Europe towards the end of last year. And more recently, we got very positive response from the US uh, PTO that this will be granted in the very near future with a few minor corrections to the application. So very excited about that uh, potential because this, this helps us. This will block anybody else from moving into the severe influenza space with P38. So we've got uh, market exclusivity in that regard. So we've got a clear development plan. We've got a chief medical officer on contract and we've got plans to put it into humans next year. We've got manufacturing in, in place and that's moving along, formulation in place, all of these boxes that need to be checked from a drug development standpoint. So very excited about this, uh, you know, getting data from this, uh, you know, towards the uh, uh, middle end of next year. So that's going to be very exciting. And again, as I say, ex ex you know, potential to expand beyond severe influenza into other viral diseases. So that's the uh, the lead program, POLB001, moving along nicely. What's coming behind, I think, is, is you know, from a um, from a data analysis standpoint, I think uh, you know it's been it's been said that uh, data is is the new uh, the new mine the new the new mining where uh, the new gold. We're going after uh, lots of data that we have that HV have generated using artificial intelligence, and we've got a number of deals on the table that we're working through. And why is this different? And I think this is a very important slide about how we're different. A lot of time for pharma, there's patients will come into the the, the, the doc's office, will come into the hospital already sick. And they take blood samples and they work their way back from that, trying to figure out what's going on, why are they sick, what's driving the disease. So we've got a different approach, again, coming from the, the stable of Open Orphan and, and HVivo, where we're bringing in healthy volunteers. These are people who are, you know, they're screened, they're identified as healthy. We bring them into the quarantine unit. We take their blood at day minus one. So we know what they look like when they're healthy. And then from that, we give them virus and we track the progress, we track the course of disease, and we're taking sampling all the way along. And these are blood samples, these are nasal samples, these are looking at uh, you know, digital biomarkers, their heart rate, their temperature, et cetera. And we're able to track all of this data forward. And we can understand what happens in a severe disease setting, what happens in moderate disease, what happens in mild disease. And when we collaborate with the AI companies, they'll take all of this data set and they'll be able to work their way back to identify what are the, what are the targets that are being active? What are the targets that the, the virus is triggering that the immune system is using? And then when we block those, we have new targets for, for new effective therapies. So very exciting in this space. This is, as I say, unique. This is unique to, to Poolbeg. And we already have data in flu, HRV and RSV and uh, COVID data, and malaria data coming. So we can go beyond the standard viruses and build from there. And this is just a quick snapshot of what we have. Uh, just um, we have a facility where we have 300,000 individual samples stored at minus 80 degrees in 22 freezers. So this is all data that's sitting there, but now we have the wherewithal, now we have the capabilities to, to use and analyze this data, identifying new targets and new drug targets and new drug uh, compounds that we can uh, put through the clinic. Uh, we announced uh, just last week, we've uh, started on our a uh, pathway we have a deal with urofins who are going to do a lot of the genetic uh, the gene expression analysis of these samples and we also have uh, other samples coming behind us that, that uh, we're working towards and as i say we're going to focus initially on rsv and we're going to focus on flu influenza to see where this takes us and i think this uh, bottom of the slide summarizes what we're going to do we're going to analyze these samples to uncover common protective pathways what the body normally uses and what the virus circumvents we're going to identify what these pathways are and what's useful in the clinic and then new drugs and drug targets that can be repositioned. Ideally, they've been in the clinic and they've been proven to be safe and effective. And then we can take these forward and uh, do our clinical studies again for relatively modest costs. And that's how we're going to, uh, again, how we are different and how we're going to uh, circumvent that expensive clinical trials that people tend to head down. I do want to spend a minute on predict viral. Again, we filed uh, intellectual property on this approach last week. Again, this is on the diagnostic side, as I say, that uh, another uh, feather in our cap of uh, infectious disease and a very exciting technology where we can identify through gene expression analysis very early in the disease cycle who is going to progress to severe disease and who isn't. So you can appreciate the value of this you know, in a community setting. If somebody comes down sick and you screen everybody else, you can identify the patients that have caught the virus and move them to the side. And then you look after them and give them aggressive antiviral therapies, separate them from the, the crowd, as it were, so that the spread doesn't, doesn't carry on. So as I say, we filed patents on that on a, on a very interesting platform that we plan to progress and progress you know, in collaboration with big pharma, big diagnostics companies, because again, leveraging their knowledge and expertise in this space. So again, a very exciting technology that only we have, and we're very excited about that and, uh, and moving that forward. 
So that's, uh, as I said, three aspects of what we have already. I will comment that we have multiple uh, discussions ongoing about in licensing programs. I think pre-pandemic, there was a lot of uh, infectious disease programs that were pushed forward, maybe ignored, not invested uh, heavily enough. Uh, but now is the time to, to bring them uh, into Boolbeg and run it through our system, our capitalized, uh, clinically uh, efficient system to get human clinical da data and partner with pharma. So my last slide here as a summary, this is a substantial market right now that's growing very rapidly, 250 billion by 2025. The capital light and multiple shots on goal will, uh, you know, as I say, de-risks you know, each individual program, but any one deal will see us generate significant revenue from pharma partnering. And as I say, the lead program, very exciting, is the POLB001 for severe influenza, a large unmet need. And as we saw you know, with the, the data coming out of India, there is concerns that in years to come that these uh, influenza uh, you know, pandemics will, will rage and we need better drugs and new drugs for these and we plan to, to participate. And again, you know, it's great to have all the excellent science and all this excellent data, but it can't be executed without an outstanding team. And that's what we have. Lots of experience uh, across the board. As I say, we've done this before. We've been successful before. We plan to be successful again with, with Poolbeg Pharma. So on that as my last slide, I'll stop. And again, happy to take uh, any questions uh, from the audience or, or from, from Donald indeed. Jeremy, thank you so much. Uh, Carl, thank you so much indeed. You've packed so much in there. Um, let's just keep the flow going and talk to you about Paul, uh, Paul 001, the influenza immune modulator. Mm -hmm. um, talk us through the next steps, you know, six to nine months in that particular yep. area. Uh, what, are the, what are the next things to happen? What are the timeframes and how much is it going to cost and how are you going to, how are you going to fund it? Sure, Donald, no, sure. I mean, we will fund it obviously by the IPO proceeds, but uh, yeah. where we are right now is, as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a ready-made baby in a sense that uh, we, we're, you know, we have just completed a campaign around non-GMP manufacturing that we'll use for formulations. These are all multiple steps when it comes to drug, uh, drug development where, uh, where we've selected uh, a vendor for, um, for GMP manufacturing that we'll announce uh, very, very soon. And again, different levels of, of quality. Uh, we're, we're working with closely with a formulations company to get the formulations going. We're, we're, we're going to have this. I mean, if you can imagine somebody with severe flu being kind of prone and prostrate, and prostrate in the hospital. So we're deciding we're going to take the IV route here. So intravenous drug administration. So we're working on a formulation for that, which is good. So we'll be in humans uh, by, the, you know, by the middle of next year to test this proof of concept you know, in, uh, in an inflammatory setting. So we're going to get humans and uh, give them, uh, you know, inflame them and then uh, we'll watch the Paul uh, 001 uh, work its magic and then take it forward very rapidly there into uh, in, into patients uh, thereafter. And once we have that, I mean, initially that you're know, having that anti-inflammatory data might be enough to partner with pharma, but they may come back and say, we want to see the influenza data and we've got you know, plans in place for that. So that's all, as I say, very efficient, very capitalized. So we will have uh, very interesting data on the inf inflammation aspects uh, towards the uh, you know the second half of next year, obviously, when, when, the, when the, this initial uh, human challenge trial runs. Okay, we've got the super cold uh, 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 just about to hit us this winter, we're, and we're just about to, as you say, you've had your, your flu jab. Uh, to what extent are these heading in the right direction, as it were, for, uh, for pullback? Yeah, I mean, if I understand, I mean, the market, I mean, as I say, pharma is funny. They're, they're sometimes like lemmings, you know, like they, they turn and, you know, they, their head turns, whatever the next, and they all rush in one direction. And I think right now they're all rushing in the infectious disease direction. <laughs> and, and as pharma knows, like they have, they have army of scientists and chemists working in the background. But, uh, you know, pick any pharma, j, j Pfizer, you know, Merck, if you look at their pipelines, they in-license so many, like up to half, maybe sometimes more of their programs are in-licensed from small biotechs or mid-sized biotechs. Well, they so they need look, you to find, find the... Exactly. The, the, they, the they, they, they look to the experts and then they pay big money to bring it in. And again, Inflasome is a great example where we were the experts in NLRP3 was our target. Again, we were in inflammation, which is similar to, to pool bags. So I bring a lot of knowledge across but they were watching and waiting. And as soon as they saw clinical data, they pulled the trigger. It's time to acquire this company. And Roche, Roche I should say Roche were the winners, but there were you know, several other pharma companies in the running, but, uh, but Roche won out in the end and uh, really, you know, really good company to work with. But they're always scrambling. I've got, as I mentioned earlier on, showing my age, the Rolodexes. You know, you have uh, all Rolodex of the BD teams. And, you know, part of the scouts is to look for new programs, look for new technologies, look for new partnerships. And as I say, infectious disease is front and center for a lot of these farmers right now. So they'll be looking to companies like ours. And, you know, we, when we have clinical data, that's when the scramble begins and they'll be wanting to, uh, to come on board and partner with, uh, 
uh, with Poolbeg. And as you saw, some of the eye-watering numbers for some of the deals. I mean, from a you know, as I say, our IPO was just three months ago, but uh, we'll be revenue generating very rapidly. On our first deal, we'll be self-sufficient, and we don't plan to raise any money thereafter. So you you mentioned the twenty five million you raised uh, in July. Yep. Um, do you have any news for us on acquisitions, licensing agreements? Presumably, what you have in mind is a buy and build uh, type thing as you build that pull bag. Correct. Yeah, correct. We're we're in we're multiple we're multiple due diligence, and I and I and I say this with a smile on my face because we we're building out the team, but we have a fantastic team of guys, you know, and, and girls who, you know, they've they've so much knowledge in the space. We're doing these due diligence on these uh, interesting assets. You know, some of them are viral, some of them are inflammation. So we're we you know obviously we're not ready to announce yet. We want to make sure that the the eyes are dotted, the t's are crossed in these uh, these deals and these collaborations. But there'll be announcements coming without question. You know, and I say we build. What field, what field might the first announcement be likely to be in? I, th- I think safe to say virology because that's our expertise right now. So we have a lot of uh, spaces, you know, a lot of opportunities in that. And again, what, what's interesting is as the word of Poolbeck got out, and again, I give Carl a lot of credit with his his network. People turned to us and says, "I've had this asset. You know, we we brought it as far as we could, and now we want somebody else to bring it into the clinic." And we're sitting there, kind of you know, lapping these up in a certain sense. But uh, obviously, we have to agree on the the, the correct terms and the, the you know the correct. De- the development plan, all these take a little bit of time. We've got a fantastic team behind us here at Poolbeg that, that, that we're working with to, uh, to, you know, to select the best opportunities and then we move them forward rapidly. Okay, talking about that uh, fantastic team, we've got that great man, Cal, sitting there doing nothing. So <laughs> like, like, let's pull him in. Oh, well, never does nothing, never does nothing. <laughs> let's, I know he's sitting there doing some work, I'm sure he is. Uh, so let's, let's pull Cal in and we'll ask him uh, uh, two or three questions, why not? Okay, um, so uh, let, let's talk about Open Orphan. Um, you know, the, the, how does the ongoing re- commercial relationship between Open Orphan, you know, the parent and Poolbeg, how, how's that going to work? How you, you've got access to each other's uh, uh, data and so on and so forth. But give us some nuts and bolts as to how that might work commercially. Who's, who's gaining, you know, I'm sure you're, you're both gaining, you know, symbiotically. How is it going to work? Yeah, Donald, I think, look, first of all, I'm still in the office in London and pulled by or with the office is pulled by and as we say open orphan on the walls both in the office in London so first of all look it's shared the big reality is you've been around long enough I've been around long enough. most people listening tonight invest in a range of small aim listed companies and it's just they all build out this big management team and they pay them a fortune and so we're trying to do a pull bag the only full-time employee is Jeremy uh, we're I'm helping out, Ian's helping out, and then we have a bunch of the scientific team, 50% in pullback, 50% in open arm. So that's unbelievable synergies and that we, uh, Germany has access to 250 scientists and then he pays for two or three of them. So that's the synergies across there. I think, look, to really understand where the company's going to go is look at a peer. We always look direction and you look at the company you keep. And I keep saying the peer is uh, Evotech in Germany. And we're fast followers. Elena Sullivan came in, she's an open orphan director. And she's kind of look, uh, she's Scottish with an Irish accent. She's kind of look, you really should look at. They've come with the roots from zero. The minute they left their zero roots, they've had a 10 X uplift, went from 400 million to 7 billion in four years. So that's, to answer your question, uh, Donald, I think I know a lot of investors saying, well, why bother on a pool bag? But I would say anybody who came into the IPO open orphan, we IPO that, 5p, 5.7p, we went to 48p. Okay, it's back down a bit now, but I would say bear with us. We're still up 4x from the IPO. Jeremy's only starting, and we have, look, my role will be to keep news flow, get things in. So we've settled in. Uh, the first bit of news flow this past week, I think we've a, a clear mandate in the company. I told Jeremy we needed an RNS every second week, uh, if not every week. So I think all I'd say for anybody listening and watching tonight, uh, pool bag is going to get busy. We have to have more assets. There's a lot of negotiation underway. We will have those six or eight assets. Any one of them will be the infamous zone, the half a billion up front. Uh, and it's unique. So I, no, I think it's um, the combination of the two of them. You do need the roots and the CRO to know how to do it. You need to know how to get the shortcuts. And you need to have all the multiple irons the far. And then it's the synergies in the same office. Chinese walls, no doubt, between us. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's cool. Okay. That was the question, Donald. That's a good answer. What, what kind of milestones can we expect over the next six to eight months then? We're, you know, we're, we're looking out, uh, out ahead, but not too far ahead, six to eight months. What's going to be happening? 
Well, I'd say maybe, I, and again, my role now, kind of, I'm reasonably busy. I'm sure people know tonight, but uh, the, one of the two full-time jobs open up. But like we've said, the Jeremy, is that the milestones is by Christmas. We need at least one or two more products on top of PO Bell 001. That should happen. We need two or three more by the springtime. I have a goal. We need six of these damn things. And I say these damn because it's, it's a lottery. Uh, you get your number, you got to work them. And then I think Jeremy, look, is clear. AI, we've got access. And look, bear in mind, open up and retain the data. People are worried, oh, where the data travel is still sitting in their reservoirs, but uh, pool bag is access to this, using it. So I think AI Germany, what else? A couple of AI deals, a few more deals, and yeah. who knows, by springtime, maybe an, an outlet a revenue deal, some revenue coming back into it. I mean, what, I mean the, 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 yeah, over to Jeremy. I should say, I should say, like the AI deal is a starting point, you know, which is great to mine the data. But what comes out the other end, and these are very efficient, you know, it could be three, four, five months where you get these new exciting targets to be beginning to work on. And I, I've, I've been involved in deals in the, in the past at Genentech where we're doing deals just on targets. So as Carl said, you could just uh, identify a new uh, therapeutic target for, uh, for an infectious disease, uh, a viral infectious disease, and you can partner with that with pharma. But yeah, we've got multiple opportunities here from, uh, from a revenue generation standpoint. We're building the company, obviously, and uh, as I said, pushing it forward and, and creating shareholder value. Okay, last question. Uh, where will Pullback Pharma be in two years' time? What will it look like in two years' time, briefly? Brief. In a dollar market cap. No Say that again? <laughs> in dollar market cap. No pressure, Jeremy. <laughs> and what's your take on that, Jeremy? Billy, I, I like, I like, I really like Carl's optimism. But yeah, we're we're going to be building like like a, a multi-tiered pipeline. I think that's the key thing here. We're going to build a team. We're going to have multiple products pushing through the you know the, the clinical and partnering, partnering, partnering. We're going to be a partner of choice for pharma. So we're going to be uh, you know deal after deal. As I say, I spent almost uh, you know twenty years in the industry doing deals. You know with a scientific background. That's the that's the fun part. But uh, as I say, let pharma take it and take on the risk and the cost and push it forward. Get it on the market. That's their expertise. Okay, Jeremy, Cahal, Senior Management Team at uh, Poolbank Pharma, thank you so much for joining us this evening on what is a very special night for us. You know, we've got a oh. huge, huge audience on board and it's fantastic to have you, you gentlemen talking. Thank you so thank much you indeed. Uh, the next man to present is David Minchin, CEO at Healing One Global. They IPO'd in AIM last year and uh, David has, has never been busier in his life, I suspect. It's all, <laughs> all happening. Um, uh, Healing One Global are a very well followed stock now in London Southeast. If you go on the chat board, you'll see you know uh, multiple posts every day for Helium One. The company are exploring for helium in Tanzania, and have already had a drilling campaign in the Rukwa Basin, which has significantly de-risked the basin, according to the company, according to David. Uh, joining us to discuss this and much more, no doubt, is the CEO himself, the man we're talking about, the man of the moment, David Minchin. I'm a Healing One CEO, David Minchin, as, a, as a Dr. Donald said, and I'm here to talk to you today about what remains the most exciting helium project uh, on the public mar market. Uh, we've got a, a basin of four and a half thousand square kilometres um, with uh, uh, surface seeps at up to ten and a half percent helium. Um, we've had a, a tumultuous eight months as a Donald might have said, um, with, uh, with, as you can see on the share chart, uh, we, we, we were up significantly pre-drilling. Um, we had a phase one exploration campaign which delivered everything that we wanted um, except, for, uh, except for gas flow. Um, since then, the share price has dropped to pre-drill to pre levels, but that's despite the significant de-risking which, which has occurred in this basin. What, 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 what do I mean by de-risking? For the first time ever, we've got proof of a excellent to good quality reservoir unit. Uh, we've got quality sealing units, especially at the top crew level. We've got multiple perspective in intervals from basement all the way up to near surface. Um, and all of that leads towards a high level of charge within a working helium sy 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 system. We know this is a system that generates and stores helium in the subsurface. The next step is for us to go out there and make the, the, make the discovery. All of this points towards an excellent buying opportunity with a share price that's not included any of the de-risking from uh, 2021. And with the start of the exciting phase two cam campaign with uh, near-term catalysts um, drilling throughout 2022, 
um, and advancing a project towards a discovery. So I'll give a little bit of background for people who aren't familiar with helium. Um, it's available for a broad range of high value end, end usage, things which it can't be substituted, and which is difficult to recycle. Uh, it's got a number of key growth sectors, mostly in high tech industries, um, health healthcare, um, and you know, computing, cloud cloud storage, um, uh, uh, fiber optic cables, that sort of thing. Um, because of this, we're expecting quite dramatic uh, growth over the next 10, 10 years, uh, from six billion cubic feet to eight and a half to ten billion cubic feet by twenty thirty, um, and existing suppliers can't keep up with demand. It's structurally undersupplied. Uh, we, we saw that over the summer when with a few small plant outages in the United States there were dramatic short shortages uh, and you know, people had to cut back on their production of semiconducting chips. Uh, new primary helium projects are required to meet the demand growth and that is especially true as we transition from the carbon economy to a green economy uh, because all these existing supplies was a byproduct of hydrocarbon pr production and helium one has the green differentiator. We have our helium sourced as a byproduct with nitrogen. It's a high grade primary helium source, 10.6% me me measured at surface with a 90% nitrogen carrier gas. That means that we can pr pr produce carbon neutral helium with uh, COP26 less than two weeks away. Uh, and as we transition from a carbon world to a green world, this is going to make helium one, which is already a strategically important asset into an essential asset uh, as we don't want to turn off the internet as we transition to a carbon economy. Uh, helium one is very significant for this transition. So what is helium one? Uh, the company was founded in 2015. Uh, where we secured 100% uh, ownership over 4,500 square kilometres of licences. We've got three, three project er er areas in uh, Rukwa, Nayasi and Balangida, all of which have got un unique geology uh, and large potential for, he for, for, for helium. We have a wealth of historic data, uh, which allowed us to calculate an unrisked perspective recoverable helium resource of 138 billion cubic feet. That's the largest helium resource in, in, in the world. It's uh, sufficient to provide the entirety of world demand for over 20 years, or more realistic, 10 to 15 percent of global demand for over a century. So we're talking about something globally strategic. We're talking about something very high, high grade, uh, up to 10.5% measured at surf surface. That's between 50 and 200 times higher than anything currently in, in, in production. And all with very simple logistics out to the port of Dalam, out to the port of Dar es Salaam and out to market. Uh, we've been engaging in phase one exploration throughout 2021. Uh, this started in February uh, with our 2D seismic cam campaign uh, that ran through throughout April uh, and throughout May and June we were able to process the results of that. Uh, we built up on our historic seismic da database and added a wealth of new prospects, uh, including Thai, uh, which was a must-drill prospect uh, based on a, a very nice looking three-way dip clo closure. Uh, that's where we placed our first hole, which was commenced in mid-June. Um, we were a very good prospect and we've done very cost-effective phase one ex exploration. Uh, our faith in drilling tie was rewarded um, less than a week into drilling when we ha had our first helium show in the lake bed form formation. Uh, we can continue down finding a he helium again in the red sandstone form formation, um, which is where the rods parted and that was actually the, the start of our, uh, of our troubles. Uh, by the end of July, uh, we drilled into the crew. Uh, we'd seen uh, thick seals. Uh, we'd seen good quality reservoirs. We had five stacked helium shows. That's uh, helium coming up with the drill muds as we, as we advanced the rods. Um, but we weren't able to test them uh, because of downhole prob problems. Uh, so what went wrong? 
we had uh, anticipated based on historical drill day data that we would have a well consolidated medium porosity reservoir. Now, slim well drilling would have worked in a well consolidated rock. It's a well, it's a tight form from form formation. The extra pressure caused by the by the mud around the bit. Uh, doesn't cause excessive the, the damage and you have a very cost effective ex exploration tool. What we found against all expectations was that we had a good to excellent quality reservoir. Now this reservoir was unduly affected by slimline drilling because it was unconsolidated. Uh, the result was is that we, uh, the high pressure that you get across the face with slimline drilling uh, caused caused excessive formation damage, it pushed mud into the reservoir, it created washouts, uh, all of which prevented us from, from running our wireline tools down and um, masked the pay zones which we were hoping to identify and which we, we had hoped to see beneath an excellent quality seal. Um, Basically, because of better than expected reservoir, we had to pull the plug on our slimline ex exploration campaign. Uh, well, what that all points to is that we need to come back with a conventional drill rig, uh, so we, we can, with conventional drill, drilling has much lower pressure across the bit because you have a wide bit on a narrow rod, which gives you a nice wide an annulus, you don't get the buildup of pressure across the, the bit, and we could drill these unconsolidated reservoirs with that bit. Uh, we need to mo mobilize a different rig to, to achieve that. So what did we learn out of 2021? Well, we have proof of concept, um, and that's significantly de-risk the, the basin. What I mean by proof of concept is that for the first time ever, we've proven charge and migration in the subsurface. Uh, we've proven that we have this excellent quality reservoir uh, all the way down through, through the crew. And we've secured rock cuttings for further analysis. We can really properly understand the stratigraphy of, of the basin, which will help us to plan our future drilling camp campaigns. Seal was the biggest risk before we started drilling. Um, that's because of a lack of clay in the basin. It's a very sandwich basin, but also helium is a very elusive gas. Uh, what we identified is a very good quality seal, 130 meters thick at the top of the crew. But we also found thinner, but effective seals are multiple levels ab 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 above that. All of that has shown that we've got a stacked system with helium shows at multiple levels uh, running from near surface all the way down to, 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 to basement. And putting this together, we have, for the first time, proof of a working helium system. Uh, that's shown from uh, the, from the mud shows and from the logging that we've got. We I mean, do 2.2% uh, helium in the lake bed form, formation at only 70 meters. That's a very positive indication. Um, at, we had a thousand times background level in the red sands, sandstone uh, that wasn't able to be tested because the rods parted in the midst of, dread, 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 in the midst of drilling this helium show. Um, in the crew, we've had good quality seal, uh, excellent quality reservoir, uh, stacked helium mud shows. We weren't able to test it be because of form, form, formation damage. All very challenging, but all very positive. What we have is a basin where we've got helium in places that we never really expected to see helium. Uh, who, who's, who's ever heard of a helium show as 70 meters? Uh, beneath a, a standard heliclastic clay. Um, who's ever heard of five stacked sequences within a, within a five stacked mud shows within a single formation in, in the crew? Uh, all of this points towards um, a basin with a, a lot more helium than we had an anticipated. And with several new play types and several untested play, to play types, which we need to investigate as part of our phase two drilling. So what is phase two? Uh, phase two, we've loosely divided these plays into shallow targets and deep targets. Now, deep targets are primarily focused on the crew structural play. That is uh, helium trapped beneath the top seal 
130 meter thick ceiling claystone that we identified in drilling Tai One, uh, looking for similar structures, or indeed drilling the same structure uh, across the across the basin. Now, to drill deep targets, we, we're going to need a conventional drilling rig, uh, and we can't mobilize one of those in in the wet sea season. But there's there's no off switch at Helium One. So what we're doing is we're pushing on with a 2D seismic uh, that's mobilizing before the rainy season comes. Uh, and that's going to focus on the northern extensions of known helium, uh, known helium bearing structures, which we've seen at Thai and in, in, in Itambula. We, we know that these uh, structures work as a focus for the migration of helium in the subsurface. And so we, we're expanding our seismic campaign, which in 2021 was limited to uh, uh, just the basin edge because we only wanted to drill down to 1200 meters depth with our slimline well. Uh, we're now going deeper into the basin uh, so that we can have a slew of targets uh, to complement our Thai target target when we mobilize our, our conventional rig in 2022. Um, the, within the top 400 me me meters are what I refer to as shallow targets. Now, these are based on the, uh, on the intraformational lake bed play. Uh, which were identified with drilling of Tai 1 and investigated further with the drilling of Tai 2. And what Tai 2 showed is that the, um, the interformational uh, play, the, 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 the reservoir with the strong helium show, which we identified as 70 meters in Tai 1, was sealed by a conventional city plastic clay. Now we've got a basin with a lot of clay in it. If it was done by some unusual salt or volcanic tuff, I might have been concerned, but with a lot of clay, there's a lot of potential for this type of clay and this type of trap to be repeated across the basin and for us to find multiple occurrences of shallow hel helium. Now, you must remember that helium is worth over 100 times more than natural gas. So whereas a conventional oil and gas exploration team would not go looking for plays in the top 400 meters, uh, for for a helium com company, this offers a low cost exploration and a low cost route into, into production and eventual for de development. So we're trying to use uh, um, ge geophysical techniques to give us direct gas indicators. And we're focusing on electro resistance to tomography and magnetotelurics, uh, but both of which um, uh, analyze the resistivity of the ground to identify void spaces. Now, um, it, ERT grew out of civil engineering. If you're going to build a skyscraper, you don't want to do it uh, above a big cave. Uh, so it's to recognize void spaces in the subsurface. I'll point your attention towards the section at the bo bottom there. Now, ignore the big purple caves. They stand out quite obviously. But you can see the the orange horizon marked limestone. Now that is a limestone horizon where the void spaces are filled with um, are filled with gas. And as you go right into the fracture zone, you can see that this orange horizon becomes green because the void spaces in the fracture zone are filled with water. Uh, so with uh, Tai One, which had strong gas indicators uh, in a shallow trap, and Tai Two, which would trap wherever you would a closure so you didn't have it have have the reservoir in place uh, we've got the perfect test bed to calibrate our ERT survey so that we're able to use the responses there to uh, identify void spaces filled with gas um, and potentially hopefully develop a portfolio of quite shallow targets uh, to be tested with a lightweight drill a lightweight drill we can mobilize in the wet season so we'd be looking to get that, that in at Q1 and Q2 of 2022. In the event of a discovery, uh, we have got a very low capex uh, development. Uh, we've done a, a, a top level scoping study based on a uh, theoretical gas composition from what we're measuring at surface uh, to produce 350,000 MCF a year, um, which is um, about one truck a day. Um, each truck contains about a quarter of a million dollars worth, worth of gas. 
uh, and the capital cost of that would be about fifty million dollars. Um, with the well, with the production wells and wellhead gathering system, you'd be looking at uh, maybe eight to eighty million dollars. Now, this is a modular plant, so uh, you can add a phase two train or phase three train. Uh, you can also adapt your train for what, for whatever shows we find. So if we find a sh sh shallow show. Uh, a, a shallow play, which is, turns into a shallow discovery, uh, then you, we could potentially use a scaled down version of the same mod modular plan to enter production for quite a low cost. This is all to be investigated throughout 2022. Um, and in production, the logistics to port are they're very simple. Uh, we've got 130 kilometers of unmade road uh, between our site and uh, Rook and the Tanzan Highway. That needs to be run over with, with, with a grader uh, to, to smooth out the bumps. Uh, the Tanzan Highway, I've spent a lot of time driving up and down that damn road, and it's a uh, very good quality. Uh, to tarmac all the way from Rukwa to the port in Dar es Salaam. And you can see from the map at the bottom there, the, the shipping routes out of Port of, Dalam, Port of Dar es Salaam naturally lead us towards the markets in the Far East and Europe, uh, where there is increasing growing demand uh, for um, helium, for high-tech manufacturing, especially semiconductor chips and, um, and fiber, fiber optic cables being produced in China, Japan, Taiwan, etc. Et cetera. Uh, in fact, they're just, they're just building a new helium storage facility in Thailand because there is such demand and such instability of supply out to the Far East. Uh, and that's really where I see us uh, being able to market the majority of, of, of our material and for a good price. So that's us. Um, it's a transformational opportunity. Uh, it's a uh, time to change the helium market um, and to to focus on a supply which can be part of a green trans green transition uh, the green economy is coming just because we uh, have switched off our petrol cars doesn't mean we're going to be prepared to switch off our cloud data centers and we need helium as part of this future society it feeds into the digital rev rev revolution and in Rukwa, because of the size of the project the high grade uh, the High uh, BCF in the in the in the uh, on the undiscovered resource. It's got potential to be a globally strategic resource, which can feed in uh, over a century worth of of supply. This resource has been significantly de-risked, um, and I'm looking forward to being able to advance our development and our exploration throughout 2022 as we bring this project towards discovery. Thank you. Okay, David, that was brilliant. Thank you so much indeed for all that. Um, let me uh, pick you up on uh, with my first question. Uh, you may believe you've de-risked the Rukwa Basin, but uh, some might say that you've only begun to uh, de-risk the basin, given that you haven't actually made your first commercial finds of helium. So what's your response to that, David? Exploration is an application of science to data, and it's an iterative pro process. Now, we, we we went out with great expectations, and I, I, you know, I really thought we had something with our phase one, one drilling. All the right indicators were, were there. However, with the rig that we bought, we weren't able to close the deal. We weren't able to flow any gas to surface. Uh, we we're able to take everything that we've learned from phase one and apply that into phase two to make sure that we've got the right equipment, the right bit, the right people be behind the project to make sure that everything works and we're actually able to make a discovery this, this year. Okay, um, uh, Paul Jones follows up on that and says, would you, would you drill it again? If you're so sure, sure that you've got so many things right about Taiwan, would you simply just drill more or less in the same place, the same area and, and do it right this time and learn so much more, maybe make a commercial find? Of helium. Yeah, I mean, Thai is a fantastic prospect, and the way that we drilled it limited our ability to make a discovery. Uh, it, with excellent quality reservoir like that, you can't apply that sort of pressure across the across the, the bit. We didn't know we had that type of red reservoir. We we thought that um, it's I suppose it's basically the same as is if if you're drilling a high grade gold, you'd need to bring a different drill machine, which isn't something that I, as a mineral geologist, is used to. However, but, but uh, would you do it again? Yes, you know, with the, with the appropriate kit this time. Yes, absolutely. With, with and I believe that with the right with, with a conventional rig, 
uh, I think we've got every opportunity of making exploration success here at Taiwan and okay. everything pointing towards it. Let, let's, let's take phase two. So what, uh, what does phase two look like? Uh, it's, you've got 10 million pounds of funding. How far does that go? Who will, who will, you, will you be uh, drilling with? And where are you in terms of uh, contracting the next drill and so on? Okay, so we're, uh, I mean, the, the, the problem with conventional rigs is that the, the, the lead time on a rig of that size is normally six to nine months. Uh, we're talking with a range of, of suppliers. We're trying to find something that's got the right combination of cost and availability for us to, de de to deliver an effective exploration program in 2022. Um, bear with us a rather fluffy timeline at, at the moment. As we contract and develop, we can start to, to narrow down. Um, and that's, that's, that's work in progress, is it, David? Oh, yes. Yeah, very much work in progress. Um, and that's really what 2022 is for, for, for me. We're not going to pause. We're not going to stop be, because it's raining. We're going to run our geophysics so that we can um, advance our portfolio and in, introduce new drilling targets to complement existing drilling tar targets so we can investigate um, the, the numerous plays that we have. But 2022 is for me really a year about disc about disc discovery. It's about applying everything that we've learned in 2021 and in the previous five years and making sure that we get it right and we make our discovery. Okay, Nahid Hussain and Ashley Hibbert both ask the same question. How far does 10 million pounds go? How many drills do you get for 10 million pounds? It goes a long way when you're tight fisted as I am. <laughs> We're, look, we, we've, we're, we're financed to do all of this geophysics. Uh, we're, we're financed to do the drilling. Uh, would we raise more money so we have a buffer or so that we can mobilize for more drilling if we uh, have more targets? Yeah, sure. Uh, but, you know, are we are our backs against the wall? Abs absolutely not. Uh, we're a well-financed company and we've got a lot of exploration mileage ahead of us. Okay, Kevin Braddle asks, a reasonable question. What kind of relationship do you have with the Tanzanian, uh, Tanzanian government and are they happy with progress so far? We've got very good relations with chips with the Tanzanian government. Uh, they've always been very supportive of our project. Um, you know, when you maintain regular communications through the through the, through the, through the, through the ministries, uh, we welcomed the Minister of Mines out to our camp uh, while, while we were drilling. Uh, it's it's all a very collegiate ap atmosphere out in uh, Tanzania, uh, and yeah, I, I highly recommend it as a jurisdiction. They're used to gas in Tanzania, but probably a lot less used to helium. Is that fair? It's uh, this is uh, the first primary helium uh, exploration project in in all of Africa, and yeah, it's a, it's a new it's new for everyone, and that's what makes it ex exciting. Okay, uh, Drew McGregor uh, makes a very good point, which you touched on when you talked about uh, shallow traps rather mm. than uh, deep ones. He doesn't actually think that the use of electro-resistance tomography, which which you were promoting there in your introduction there, and magenta telluric surveys, he thinks that ad identifying gas trapped in that near surface is is not the way to go because no ONG exploration company does this. They don't use that technology, and he thinks it doesn't work. So he does think it takes investor expectations the wrong direction, though. What's, what's your response, your considered response to that? Well, I mean, we, you've got to think that we're not, we're not exploring for oil and gas. We're a helium ex exploration company, and helium is worth 100 times more than the value of oil and gas. So you need to take off your oil and gas hat and think with a helium hat on. Now, if I was looking for standard Brent, I wouldn't be looking in the top 400 meters you know you, you don't have the poor pressure you, you don't have the volumes trapped within the same size closure um but for a helium gas it's worth 100 times more you can easily you can potentially find an, a, an economic accumulation uh with, with within the top 400 met meters i think if i did some calculations and if you're if your reservoir was at 250 meters uh, you need a closure of uh, about seven square kilometers to contain a BCF. Uh, a BCF of gas is worth between 250 and 350 million dollars, which if, you're, if your cost to bring into production is only 30, 30 million, that gives you an IRR of over 55%. It's not the, 
it's not the grand prize in the same way as the deep targets are, where you could get that same volume in a much smaller uh, size trap. However, it has the potential to be economic in its own right. It has the potential to be a low cost route into production. Uh, and it needs, it, needs to, uh, it needs to be investigated. Uh, ERT is a very low cost exp exploration method. And, uh, and the reason that the oilies don't, don't use it is simply the economics are totally different. Yeah, yeah, it's a totally different game. I mean, you know, no, nobody uh, mines iron ore at uh, three grams per, per ton, but you would gold. Indeed. OK, let's move on. Carl Patch wants to know what the current relationship with Mitchell drilling is. Uh, there was a few other questions around Mitchell drilling. Um, lay all these things to rest for us, will you please, David? So, yeah, Mitchell drilling, uh, that we've fulfilled their con they fulfilled their contract and uh, we've released the rig. Um, it was it became up became apparent that that slimline well what, what wasn't going to work uh, in the reservoirs that we had and so continuing to drill with them would cause more more harm than good uh that was well well, well understood that the, the whole ran considerably over in time with the number of operational difficulties that we had however these contracts are paid per per meter so of over time overrun was high the cost overrun wasn't uh, so look, I'm very happy with Mitchell drilling. Uh, it, it didn't work out, but uh, we're we're both fine now, and uh, I, I wish them well in the future. Okay, David Crowley asks, "What will be the final question?" You've got uh, we're one more minute to go. David Crowley says, uh, "David, with the plans you put forward today, uh, uh, V and, and RNS, how long will it take be before we need to raise more funds?" And by what amount, assuming we're still searching for that discovery? Well, I presume you are still searching by all accounts. So, David, don't be like that. Uh, and tell us all, David. Yeah, so uh, we are in the process of uh, identifying and contracting the, the correct uh, conventional rig. Uh, in the in the RNS and in the presentation, I say that's planning to be on the field Q3 or Q4 of next year. Uh, that's a sort of a worst case scenario. Uh, normally these rigs have got a six to nine month lead, lead time. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping ideally to get stuff on, on the ground June, July, August, the same as we had this, this year, drilling the sweet spot of the summer season. Uh, as I said, we're well financed to do the exploration that we're doing at, at the moment. We've got 10 million pounds left in the bank. Uh, our backs aren't against the wall for, for, um, for, for, for raising capital. Uh, it's a very exciting year for 2022. Uh, and I think it's going to be really good to go out again with the right knowledge, the right equipment uh, and make this dis discovery that we've been promising the market. David mentioned. Uh, see you at, at uh, Helium One Global. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Our final company this evening, our South Africa-based rare earths company, Rainbow Rare Earths, or RBW. Rare earth metals are an essential component for permanent magnets uh, used to construct motors and wind turbines. And most rare earths are found in China. Uh, Rainbow have two main, main low-cost, high-quality projects, the Falabora Gypsum Stacks in South Africa and a trial mine at Gakara, in Burundi. Uh, Rainbow have just raised 6.4 million in a placing. And here's CEO George Bennett. He's coming live from South Africa tonight to summarize the most recent deals and activities for us. All right, over to you, George. Thank you, Donald. Um, good evening, audience. And uh, thank you for taking the time out this evening. Just to go through my presentation, um, there's the disclaimer for all of us to take note of. Um, and then, um, as Donald has mentioned, that um, rares are critical to the to the green revolution that's taking place around the world at the moment. And and by that, what I mean is that we all know that there's a there's uh, there's um, government uh, legislation driving um, electric vehicle um, electric vehicles in uh, in Western Europe and uh, and in the UK, and we also see. Worldwide emission uh, control standards being uh, being adhered to, or, or or going to be adhered to, uh, with everyone signing the various protocols around the world, and there's massive, massive um, uh, push for green energy in the form of solar and wind turbines to try get the world to meet these emission control standards that everyone has set themselves. Um, we all know that uh, 
In the UK, they're talking about no internal combustion engine vehicles being sold past 2030. France, I think, is 2035. Volvo have already said that they will not uh, produce an internal combustion engine motor vehicle past 2030 either, and I'm sure Germany is close behind. Plus, we have the um, all the wind, tur uh, wind turbine projects that have been spoken about, be it in China, be it in the South, South China Seas, Germany, the North uh, Sea um, uh, wind uh, turbine project and so forth. And all these uh, these these projects and these these uh, new these new targets for various governments require rares and the key rares for the green revolution are what they call permanent magnets and permanent magnets um, go into every new electric vehicle and your 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 standard vehicle at the moment in terms of your electric windows your wind uh, windscreen wipers and so forth but very importantly in the electric uh, vehicles. The drive train or the or the drive motor for for your electric vehicle requires between one and two kilograms of uh, rare earth um, permanent magnets per vehicle, and each wind turbine, uh, three megawatt wind turbine, requires about two tons of uh, rare earth elements in their permanent magnets. So just to move on, as you can see, the two key elements four permanent magnets are known as neodymium and praseodymium, uh, which are two of the 17 rare earth elements that we find in rare earth deposits. There's a total of 17 rare earth elements uh, in rare earth deposits, and each deposit has various, various makeups of these different rare earth elements. Uh, as I said, the two key rare earth elements are neodymium and uh, praseodymium, and there's also another element called dysprosium, which is also quite important in certain permanent magnets. Now, permanent magnets only make up 35% of, of uh, rare earth volume, uh, uh, rare earth by volume, but very importantly, 91% by value. And that you'll see is very important for Rainbow Rare Earth's two projects where we have high values of neodymium and praseodymium in both of our projects. And that translates into very high uh, value for both those projects. If we just quickly move on to, to global demand for um, for um, neodymium and praseodymium, as you can see, global demand from 2020 is set to increase uh, dramatically by 2030, and that's as I said, it's been driven by by legislation and emission targets that the whole world is setting itself. And as I said, um, you know, this is a structural change in in, in, in global economies, and it's not going away uh, anytime soon. So, if anything, it's going to accelerate, and, and and that forecast is probably conservative. Um, we go on to our next slide. Once again, it just this is just showing you projected annual global electric vehicle sales, which as you can see are increasing quite dramatically. And, um, and as I said, this is not going away anytime soon. And then of course we have permanent magnets, uh, uh, which are required in wind turbines. And as I mentioned, uh, 600 odd, uh, kilograms per megawatt, so three megawatt uh, wind turbine, takes up to two odd tons of, uh, of rares in the permanent magnets. So that's a huge amount. And if you look, if you research the amount of, of gigawatts being forecast to be rolled out over the next 20 and, uh, sort of 10 to 20 years, you'll see this translates into a massive demand for neodymium and praseodymium. If we move on to where we see the, uh, the demand balance, um, the forecast is um, for once got it right in 2020, towards the end of 2020, they forecast that we'd be going into deficit. And we saw this uh, this happening in the neodymium presidium market and uh, where um, we saw prices of neodymium and presidium spike um, starting in the uh, last quarter of 2020 and continuing into 2021. So as I said, um, so far the forecasters have uh, have got this right for a change. Um, slide eight is quite important where it shows Rainbow's two projects in terms of their rare earth baskets. As I mentioned earlier, um, all rare earth deposits have a combination of 17 rare earth elements in what's known as a rare earth basket. And, and, and both the rare earth baskets, we have uh, the Pelabora project in South Africa and the Gokara project in Burundi. Um, we have high percentages of neodymium, praseodymium as a value of our rare earth basket. And you can see the price forecast for our basket um, uh, um, that after 2030 uh, in the dotted line 
but the actual price of our basket has uh, outstripped the forecast quite considerably. As I mentioned, towards the last quarter of 2020, we saw the rare earth prices for neodymium and presidium uh, rise quite sharply, and they've continued to maintain onto those rises. And the forecast for 2022 is that there's going to be continued uh, price appreciation of these two key rare earth elements, as well as, near, uh, as, well as sorry, dysprosium and terbium, which are quite important rare earth elements. Now, if I can move on to our key project, which is the Pelabora project. This is a project uh, in South Africa that um, comprises of um, plus minus 38 million tons of gypsum residue. Um, and the gypsum residue grades at 0.43% total earth oxides. Now, this might sound quite low, but when you can compare this, um, uh, this rare, rare earth resource uh, to iron and clay deposits in China and elsewhere in the world, you see that that grade is significantly quite high between 042 and 0.46% TREO. As I mentioned, um, these gypsum stacks are, are situated in Pelabora because for a period of 50 odd years, next door, um, we had a, a phosphate hard rock deposit being mined for phosphate. The phosphate hard rock was uh, converted through a, a flotation process into a hard rock slurry uh, and then piped next door to a phosphoric acid plant which was run by Sassel, the chemical conglomerate in South Africa. This, uh, this phosphate slurry was uh, the feed for, as I mentioned, this phosphoric acid plant. And the phosphoric acid plant uh, went through three stages of phosphoric acid production. Um, and in each of these stages, um, a gypsum residue was uh, created. Now the rare earth elements were present in the hard rock deposit at Foscor, but not in economic quantities. And with the, 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 uh, the formation of a phosphate uh, concentrate, this was through a flotation process, your rare earth elements were upgraded in the phosphate slurry. And then, as I mentioned, uh, uh, transported next door to the phosphoric acid uh, production plant. And then the three stages of, of um, phosphoric acid production, the gypsum residue that was eventually um, sent out to the waste stacks um, and after the third stage, at each of these stages, the rare earths were further upgraded in the in the gypsum residue that they now are present in economic quantities. And um, very importantly, we've got very low uranium and thorium, uh, one of the low, lowest of any project in the world. And uh, that makes this a very green project and has huge ESG credentials. Another thing to remember is that these, uh, these two gypsum stacks that we have at Pelabore, as I mentioned, totaling 38 million tons, they, um, they um, are, have an environmental uh, management system in place and uh, we will be cleaning up these gypsum stacks and redepositing a, a clean benign gypsum on a new gypsum stack to RFC standards, which makes this project a very big ESG cleanup project and very green. If I can move on to um, this next slide. This demonstrates why we believe that this will be a very low um, uh, capital intense project because the, the gypsum that sits on the chemical stacks is basically in, in a crack chemical form. Now, if you research any rare earth project, you'll see that they have to mine, crush, mill, produce a rare earth concentrate. Then they have to crack their rare earth mineral into a chemical form before they can do downstream processing. Sassel were able to go straight um, in their pilot plant that they built some seven odd years ago. They're able to go straight downstream and produce a mixed rare earth carbonate because the Gypsum sits in a crack chemical form. So all your costs associated with hard rock mining for a normal project, running mine stockpiles, crushing and milling, uh, flotation using re reagents to produce uh, a concentrate and then gang leaching uh, this, um, this concentrate. And then you have to crack, uh, crack your rare earth uh, mineral concentrate before you can go and go into rare earth um, leaching, which is where Paderborn comes in. So we've got very, very low uh, mining cost because it sits all above the ground as a resource or already, um, already um, or it, it's not mined, this was produced through a chemical process, but it sits on these two gypsum stacks. And as I mentioned, we will have a very, very low reprocessing cost of um, sort of below a dollar a ton, whereas uh, a hard rock mining open pit project your, your, your mining and hauling costs, just to give an example, is anywhere between 40 and $60 a ton. So we have a very, very low cost there, and we don't have to go through as many stages as other earth projects. 
And so as a consequence, um, we believe that this will be a very low capital intensity, a very low OPEX project, just simply for the, for the reasons I've outlined um, um, ahead <clears throat> on the slide. We now move to the next slide. We can, you can see, um, uh, also does a deal with KTEC. Uh, now KTEC is a, a technology in Florida that we have signed an exclusive right to for phosphate gypsum in Southern Africa. And basically what KTEC does is it allows us to go even further downstream um, at Rainbow. So we can go into separated rare earth oxides. Um, Linus claim that they will be the only scale producer of separated rare earth oxides outside of China, while Rainbow will be the second uh, scale project because um, we're going to go all the way downstream by using this KTEC technology. It allows us to, with, with a lot lower capex and opex, um, to, to go into separated rare earth oxides and this, this um, by, and sorry, and we get there in between six and nine steps, whereas using traditional solvent extraction uh, techniques, we literally have to have hundreds of steps to get to the, to get to the, the same rate of separation that we're going for at Rainbow. And very importantly, we only chase four rare earth oxides, uh, separated oxides, neodymium, presidium, dysprosium, and terbium. Those four rare earth oxides will give us 95% of the value of our basket. So we're very fortunate in that. And we'll get there between six and nine steps as opposed to literally hundreds of steps with, with a traditional SX plant. This project has been piloted on rare earth uh, phosphogyp or phosphogypsum for rare earths in Florida. And in North Africa, it's been piloted on a large bulk scale um, on, uh, on phosphogypsum to remove uranium and thorium. And we know it's been successful um, in, North, in North Africa. So we believe this project is, is largely, this uh, technology is largely proven. And before we, we finally um, build, uh, incorporate this into our, our project at Pelabora, we'll also pilot test it on site at Pelabora, where we have a pilot plant as part of our JV agreement with Bosfeld. So um, we believe this, this project is largely, this technology is largely dearest. And very importantly, KTEC have applied it commercially in a number of other industries like the lysine, sugar, phosphate industry um, to date. So we believe it has been largely dearest. Um, just to move on to um, where our footprint, uh, our projects against other projects around the world, just a few projects. There, our footprint is Palabora against other rare earth projects of iron and clay in nature. And you can see we literally between six and 10 times higher grade, which is very important. And very importantly, you can see our near and presidinium content parts per, per million is off the charts compared to those other iron and clay deposits. And now uranium and thorium levels are very, very low. In terms of um, Rainbow's uh, hard rock project at Kokara in Burundi, once again, a very high grade uh, deposit, very, very high as I mentioned, the neodymium and presidinium, as you can see from that table, and very importantly, low levels of uranium and thorium compared to some other hard rock projects in the world right now. If you look at Linus's uh, thorium content, you see it, uh, it's significantly higher than, um, than um, Rainbow. And we all know that Linus has had problems with the Malaysian government where they've had to build a whole new separation facility in Australia because line, uh, of course the Malaysians will not allow liners to ship their concentrate to Malaysia anymore for downstream processing. They want their radioactive waste to be kept in Australia where it came from in the first place. If we look at the, um, the actual uh, gypsum stacks at Palabora, very importantly, this project sits in the middle of a mining town. There are three, three operating mines right on the border of Palabora. So we have all the infrastructure available uh, to us on our doorstep, which is an airport, two rail sidings, which operate on this site. And the, on the right-hand side of this photograph, there's a phosphoric acid plant that's been mothballed, I forgot to mention, for the last seven, seven years. Um, it ceased to be operating, but what's intact on the site are all the administration offices, all the workshops, the machine shops, the vehicle storage shops and uh, vehicle workshops, um, laboratories, and, um, and two rail sidings, as, as well as a high voltage switchyard, high power voltage switchyard at the base of the one stack. And that all that infrastructure is in place. And this infrastructure on a normal project would represent about 20% of your capital costs. So this is another big saving for the project we have at Palabora, very important. Just quickly to go through, you can see some of the photographs of the infrastructure, as well as the Sassel pilot plant built and operated some seven years ago. This plant produced three tons of a mixture of carbonate. So it was a 
uh, pilot plant at scale, and we know it successfully extracted rare earths out of the phosphate gypsum. Um, there's another photograph of the pilot plant, and here's the details of our earning agreement um, that we um, have um, at Palabora. So it was a very good deal that we did last year, and uh, we expect it to, to produce a very, very good, good project in terms of low capital costs, low OPEX, and we're expecting this thing to generate somewhere between 220 and 250 million dollars of revenue um, and we have a very fast track um, uh, timeline for the project we're busy doing a PEA um, which will be um, uh, anticipated to be complete by the end of this year and the next year we'll go in all probability um, straight to a bankable feasibility study uh, and to go into project funding at the end of next year to start construction somewhere towards the end of the first quarter or the beginning of the second quarter of 2022. It's a very fast, pro fast track project for uh, uh, essentially, which is a new project we only acquired in November last year. Um, just to quickly finish off on Gokara, um, a very, very high grade, hard rock uh, project in Burundi. We have 57 targets, all of them mineralized, which is key. And we, are, we have seven historical Belgium uh, rare earth mines within our mine license area, very importantly. And these are just uh, after the exploration work we did last year. These are our current exploration targets that we will look to use from cash flow generated from the project within Burundi. Um, um, as you can see, before I got involved in Rainbow, we were mining on the left-hand side of the screen using artis uh, literally, um, this is where the Belgians mined it. I called it artisanal mining on steroids. We had a bit of yellow equipment to remove dirt. And then we had, we um, hand mined the very high grade red veins. We changed the mining methodology um, uh, last year into more conventional open pit mining, increased the fleet um, to a more conventional style uh, mining fleet, open pit mining fleet. And I'm pleased to say that um, we achieved uh, cash flow positive um, uh, territory in June this year when, and at the end of June, the Burundi government uh, uh, put us on hold um, for production in Burundi while we, we renegotiate the mining convention. Now we've seen in various African countries, um, governments look to renegotiate the mining conventions, but something we have to live with, we are due back in Burundi next month to negotiate with the governments the terms of the, 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 the changes to the convention. And we expect uh, that there will be a win-win outcome for, for both Rainbow and the government. That's it in a nutshell. Okay, that's absolutely fantastic, George. So what's going on with the Burundi government? And just give us shine a little bit of a light into that and and how quickly you think it's going to be resolved, George. How how what's a positive outcome for you? As I said, we um we've been we've received a letter from the Minister of Mines indicating that we will get dates set for negotiations towards the end of November. So towards the end of November, I expect to be back in Burundi uh, in negotiations with the government to get us back to mining, back to exporting and, um, and uh, finalizing the terms of a new convention towards the end of the first quarter of next year. And uh, during that first quarter, I would also expect mining operations in Burundi to continue. I might stress that we have $1.4 million of concentrate ready to be exported, which uh, all the costs associated with that concentrate have been incurred by Rambo already. So that will kickstart the, the, the reestablishment of the mining operation in Burundi without any drain on the corporate GNA. From the, from the funds that we've just received um, uh, from our capital raise that we closed last, last week in Rainbow. So Dave Harris is asking, has an export agreement been reached with, with the Burundi government? But is that the issue? Is it a renegotiating of the, of the mining conventions rather than it, export? It's a, it's a renegotiation of the mining convention, which will allow us to re resume exports and resume mining again. Great. But okay. I might just stress that, that Burundi in terms of Rainbow is, is far smaller than what it was prior to the Palabora project coming on. Just to give you an idea, the Palabora project, we expect to generate revenue, as I said, north of 200 to $250 million per, per annum. And the Burundi project at full-scale commercial production at current pricing will only produce revenue of about $30 million a year. So there's a significant difference in the size of the projects. No, it, it's absolutely true that Rainbow Rare Earths has actually transformed. In the time that I've been doing interviews with you, uh, the business has actually uh, transformed. The different deals, the way you've knitted, knitted these different elements together is, is, I have to say, it's pretty impressive, George. Thank you.
Um, let's talk Falabora gypsum stacks. Uh, Bothveld. Now, without Bothveld, you actually wouldn't be able to do all this because Bothveld, Bothveld actually owned the site and owned the stacks. Correct. So talk, talk us through the 70-30 joint venture that you've struck with them, which is one of these great deals that you've done. Yeah, well, so we were fortunate enough to, to seize on this opportunity and, um, and have a relationship with, with the, 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 um, the owners of Bosfeld and basically agree on a deal where um, they put in the resource and the infrastructure, which is significant, as I mentioned, uh, and for that, Rainbow will um, fund the establishment of, uh, of the rare earth um, processing uh, facility and uh, and for that we get 70 percent and now we get 30 percent and then the next element you've added on top of that is key, uh, key tech technology which separates the ndpr from the gypsum which in itself well, is 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 a transformation transformational for fellabora yes well the beauty of that uh, deal is that if we stopped to the mixture of carbonate which a lot of earth projects in the world do stop at we would only achieve about between 65 and 70% of the separate, separated rare earth oxide price. The fact that we now go all the way downstream to produce separated rare earth oxides means we'll get close to 100% of that separated rare, rare earth oxide. So we get a kicker of plus minus 30% in our revenue. And, and I can tell you that we have, don't have the numbers yet, it'll come out of the PEA, but the, the capital um, uh, that we incurred to go all the way to a separated rare earth oxide will be very, very quickly paid off uh, by the increase in the, in the revenue that we get. And how sure are you that the KTech technology will actually work? As I said, we are at this stage about 95% sure. We can only say 100% once we've piloted it ourselves at Palaboa, but it's been piloted um, on phosphogypsum for rare earths in, uh, in America. It's been piloted on phosphogypsum in North, uh, North Africa or at a large scale for uranium and uh, uh, thorium extraction from phosphogypsum, which is essentially the same process that we will be doing at, at Palaboa. And it's been applied commercially to other industries. So it has been largely de risked. It's just that final, final tick in the box can only come with our hand on our heart once we piloted ourselves at Palaboa. Fair point. Uh, Martin Curry asks, is there a possibility you might be able to use the K-Tech technology in other uh, phosphogypsum projects in Southern Africa? Have you come across any which might be suitable, George? It is certainly applicable to other phosphogypsum projects uh, that we might come across in Southern Africa, and we are investigating other opportunities. Do such things exist, though? I mean, is this simply one-off, or are there actually other gypsum stacks out there, or, or is it simply not yet known? Uh, can I plead the fifth? Uh, yeah, no, the fifth. Yeah. commercially sensitive is the is the yeah. phrase I think we use. Yes, yeah, it's commercially sensitive. It's commercially but, sensitive, not a yeah. problem. I'm moving on. Um, uh, uh, people have been asking what the 6.4 million placing money gets spent on. Uh, it, was, it was a good raise. Uh, what's that for? Is it possible to break down where that money goes for us? Uh, yes. and, and the various yes. lines in the budget. So. Um, you know, part of that is to complete the PEA that we've started at Palaboa. It's been kicked off already, um, which is significant, obviously, in terms of, of footprinting the, the profitability of this project and the RRR of this project for the whole world to see. Um, and then we, and that's also going to be, enable me to, to complete a bankable feasibility study on Palaboa. Um, so it's quite, a, it's quite significant in the fact that I don't anticipate coming to the market again for funds um, to complete a bankable study, which will obviously, um, hopefully, um, if, uh, if, my, uh, if my knowledge of the project is correct, which will obviously um, showcase a fantastic project at, uh, at PEA stage as well as bankable stage. But very importantly, um, you know, we will be funded through to that stage. Of the project. In, in this latest raise, you mentioned an, an interesting company called TechMet who participated in the placing. Is it possible to tell us who TechMet are and why that relationship is significant? Why it's a, it's a, a real uh, feather in your cap? Well, TechMet came in as a cornerstone investor in this, in this raise. They were already a tiny shareholder in Rainbow, but they've now, after two years assessing various rare earth projects around the world, they've decided to make Rainbow their preferred rare earth player. TechNet is a strategic minerals fund, uh, which is largely funded by the US government. So the DFC, um, I think, 
uh, invested circa 150 million dollars into TechMet last year, and uh, which is which is uh, which is as I said, significant because it's essentially the U.S. government, and the fact that they now are taking and building a strategic stake in Rainbow, I think, is very significant. Okay, uh, two two final final questions. I am very cheeky, George. Uh, Ian Wright asks, "What are the projects that are in the pipeline?" Peter Wollstonehomes asks, "What's happening in Zimbabwe?" So, are there any other projects in the pipeline in Zimbabwe? I can conflate those two questions. You know, what, uh, what, what, what do you make of all that? So, in Zimbabwe, we have uh, licenses uh, on prospective uh, rare earth uh, ground that we've pegged. We are just starting a very very small initial exploration program there. But it'll be a hard rock um, uh, rare earth project if it is a project at all. As I said, we need to do the exploration. But it has been identified by the USGS, which is the United States Geological Society, as having the potential to host rare earth. So we're in the right neighborhood. We know that. It's just a question of whether there's anything economic there. And then, uh, and yes, we are looking at uh, other opportunities. Uh, that's what I can say in the phosphogypsum uh, arena. More commercial sensitivities. <laughs> Yes. Okay, George, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much. So thank you very much to all our speakers for joining us live from around the world tonight and to all their teams, particularly all their teams, because I know everybody works really hard uh, behind the scenes to get them here. A huge thanks to you all for being such a great audience and staying with us to the very end, not the bitter end, I hope. Uh, we're truly grateful for your time. Good night and may all your investments be good ones.